All right, so welcome back. This is going to be screencast number three for chapter 24. And in this screencast, we are going to be looking at a group of fish that are commonly identified as the bony fishes. Now, they belong to the superclass Osteichthys. And when you talk about the bony fish, we're going to break these down into two major classes. And the first class is going to be called the ray fin fishes, and they belong to the class Actinoterygii. And the second is going to be the lobe fin fishes, and they belong to the class Sarcopterygii. And if you notice down here towards the bottom, we have a good example of a ray fin fish. And I mean, the primary thing you want to do here is you want to look at the differences between the fins. And if you notice, um, each of the fins that you see on this fish are going to basically be made up of a series of rays. And the rays tend to be sort of a kind of rigid part that you would find um, within the fin. And over here on the right hand side, these are called the lobed fin fishes. Um, again, these include the lung fishes and the very primitive coelacanth. And if you notice, their fins are a little bit different because they tend to be a little bit longer and usually somewhat fleshy in appearance. In fact, some scientists will actually sort of compare them to sort of like rudimentary limbs that you might find in land animals. Now, modern-day bony fish actually constitute about 96% of all the living fishes that you would find on this planet. And this actually is about half of all the vertebrates or the um, animals with backbones that you would find on the planet as well. Now, they can range from about 10 millimeters to about 17 meters long, and they can weigh up to 900 kilograms. Now, if you think about it, there's about 2.2 pounds for every kilogram. So you're talking about an animal or a fish in this case that could weigh between 1,800 and actually 2,000 pounds. And so that's a pretty hefty fish. Now, some can live in hot springs that could reach up to 112 degrees Fahrenheit. And you can also find some fish that actually will survive under Antarctic ice down to 28.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, some will live in salt concentrations that would be almost three times what you would find in ocean or seawater. And you even have some fish that are going to be found in areas where um, the water is actually devoid of oxygen. In other words, the level of oxygen you would find in those areas, those swamps, would be so low that most fish would not be able to survive. But what they've done is they've actually adapted in a way where they can actually gulp um, atmospheric op oxygen from the surface and use that um, to respire. Now when you think about prehistoric fish, you're thinking about fish that actually had very heavy dermal armor. In other words, they don't look very similar to the typical ray fin fish that you would find today. Um, most of the fish today are going to have a light, very thin, very flexible type of scale. And it's normally going to fall into two categories. It's either going to be a cycloid scale, which you would see right over here. These are the cycloid scales. Or it's going to be um, considered a tenoid scale. And the tenoid scales would be right here. Now, some eels, catfishes, and other have actually lost their scales. And so they really don't fall into any of the four categories you see over here. And by the way, this very first category that you see is the placoid scales that we had looked at um, in the sharks. And so for this diagram, it's really interesting to compare um, all the different scale types that you would find in fish. Now, um, when you think about the ray fin fishes, um, the way that these fishes have evolved has definitely worked to increase their mobility, um, which allows them to be able to evade predators, and it has definitely helped to improve their feeding efficiency as well. Now, this increase in mobility is going to actually serve a variety of functions. Um, it's going to allow this animal to be better when it comes down to breaking. Um, it's definitely going to be much better when it comes down to streamlining throughout the environment. And there's also a lot of fish out there that will use um, their fins in various ways to help them communicate in a, in a social type of way. And usually that's in response to any type of maybe territorial or reproductive type of behavior. Now, when you look at the fins, you're also going to notice that when you compare these to the um, sharks we had looked at in the previous screencast, the sharks had what we call a heterocircal tail, where the top part of the tail was actually larger than the bottom part. But when you talk about the ray fin fishes, you're going to talk about a tail that is actually now considered homocircle. And again, the prefix HOMO is going to refer to the same. So if you notice over here on the right, 
um, the perch, which is the type of fish you guys will look at in class. If you look at the top part of that tail fin, it's pretty much the same as you would see on the bottom part. Now again, when you compare these fishes to the um, prehistoric fish, you're going to notice also that the jaw has definitely changed. You're going to notice the fish can now um, be much more efficient when it comes down to um, suctioning or bringing that food in. And they also now have the ability to actually push out or protrude that jaw as well. And so both of these are going to help them when it comes down to being very efficient at securing food. Now because we're talking about animals that live in a completely different environment compared to some of the animals that we've talked about previously, um, there's very special structural and functional adaptations that have occurred with this group of animals. Now when you think about locomotion, the ability to um, move across land or, or through the air is definitely much different when it comes down to moving through water. So fish have developed a very efficient mechanism to be able to um, basically allow them to move from place to place. And they're going to use two parts of their body. They're going to use the trunk, which is going to be made up of lots and lots of muscles. And you can see these muscles located right through here, um, from right behind the head to almost where that tail fin starts. And of course, the fins themselves are going to be used to help propel them as well. And when you think about a fish and actually how it moves throughout the water, a lot of fish will perform what we consider undulations. And that's basically a movement that kind of looks like an S. And so in essence, this fish is essentially moving back and forth and kind of pushing itself against the water. Now when you look at the muscles of the fish, you're going to notice um, it's kind of um, situated in sort of a zigzag type of band or pattern. And we give a special name to those muscles. We call them myomeres and they typically have a W shape on the side of the fish. And I think part of your lab that you guys will look at when it comes down to um, dissecting the, the bony fish or the perch is that it's going to have you remove some of the scales and make, make some observations of that kind of W nature that you would find with, um, with those muscles. Now internally these bands are going to be folded and they're going to be nested on top of each other. So each myomere is going to pull on several of the vertebrae that you would find in this animal. And of course as it pulls on those vertebrae, that's where you're going to get the undulations happening in the movement of the fish. Now when you're an animal that actually lives in a medium such as water, what you're probably going to find is that if you have a skeleton that's made of bone and even the cartilage of some fish, those fish are probably going to be a little bit heavier than the water itself. And so you need to find a way to maintain your buoyancy. Now remember, buoyancy is simply the ability to maintain position within that environment. Now, if you're a shark, the way that you're going to do it is you are just going to continuously be on the move because they don't have the special swim structure that the ray fin fishes have, which is a swim bladder. The shark actually had a liver that produced a lot of special fatty oils or hydrocarbons. They call it squalene. And that actually helped to keep the shark a little bit buoyant. But again, to continually move throughout the environment was the primary way that that shark would maintain its um, position in that water. Now, as we had said, the ray fin fishes, on the other hand, they have a special structure called a swim bladder. And this is essentially a gas-filled space that is kind of acting like a flotation device for this animal. And over here on the right hand side you can see the swim bladder located right through here. And when you dissect into your perch you should be able to locate that bladder. In fact I want you guys to do your best to try not to pop the bladder. Now fish are going to control the depth that they're at in their environment by actually adjusting the volume or the amount of gas that's going to be found in that bladder. Now they might do it a couple of different ways. There are some fish that can actually release the gas from the bladder through their mouth. There's also some fish out there that actually have special um, ducts or glands that can actually release that gas back into the bloodstream or actually put it back into the bladder. Now when you think about an animal that can actually live in water like the fish can, you need to understand that the ability for them to detect sounds and even other vibrations that would be found in their environment isn't quite the same because sound doesn't move through water the same as it does through air. And so there are some species of fish that have developed very special ways to sort of detect faint sounds. 
And so fish do have ears, but their ears tend to be on the inside, so they have an inner ear. And the way that they will actually detect these sounds is by the use of these semicircular canals that are connected in some species to a special structure called Weberian ossicles. In other words, we've seen the word ossicles before, which simply means sort of a bone-like structure. And those structures can actually be used to sort of pick up those vibrations that are found in the water. Now, respiration in fish is not unlike some of the animals that we've talked about in previous groups. They do have gills, and these gills are made up of various filaments with what we consider plate-like lamellae. And if you look over here on the right, um, you can notice that we have a blown-up version of this gill, which would be right about here. Typically, that um, gill is going to be covered with a operculum or a gill plate. And over here on the right, the kind of sharp, spiny um, structures that you see right here, these are considered the gill rakers. This right here is considered the gill arch. And these are going to be the individual filaments and these filaments are going to have the lamellae. And those lamellae are going to be responsible for picking up the oxygen that's found in the water. Now, if you notice, it says the pumping action by the operculum actually helps to move the water through the gills. And so the way that it does that is simply, in most cases, that operculum or that bony cover that covers the gills is going to be held tightly closed. When this animal actually takes in water through its mouth, that water is going to find its way to these lamellae, these filaments. Now, when the animal actually opens up its operculum, that water is going to be forced pretty forcefully over those filaments, and that's going to help to basically kind of push that O2 from the water into the gills of the animal. So in other words, the water flow over the gills is going to be continuous because if you've ever watched a fish respire, they are constantly opening and closing that operculum. <clears throat> Now the water flow is going to be opposite to the blood flow and this is going to maximize gas exchange. And this is basically to help ensure that, that O2 is being, as we had said, forcefully kind of put into the um, circulatory system of these animals so it can be transported to other areas of the body. Now there are some fishes that will use a very special type of respiratory process called RAM ventilation to force that water across the gills. And so they have special ways to sort of ensure that you put even more force against that gill filament to help ensure that O2 is put into that animal's body. Because if you're an active fish, you probably have a higher oxygen requirement than animals or fish that are less active. Now, depending on whether you are a freshwater or a saltwater fish, osmotic regulation becomes really important. Now, when we use the word osmotic, we think about the word osmosis. And osmosis simply refers to the ability of water to get into the cell or out of the cell. Now, we have to kind of think about this because freshwater fish, believe it or not, have tissues that have a very high salt concentration. And so when you have a tissue that has a lot of salt, all right, and you have an outside environment that has very little salt, that um, water that's going to be found on the outside is constantly going to rush into the cells of that animal. And so the kidney is constantly working to make sure that that water is being pumped out. And there's actually going to be some very special salt absorbing cells in these animals to move those salt ions from the water into the fish's blood. So we have to sort of maintain a balance um, back and forth. But if you're a marine fish, Believe it or not, you actually have tissues that are very low in salt concentration. And so in this case, you have an outside environment that is really heavy in salt, and you have an inside environment in your cells that have very low salt. Believe it or not, these animals actually tend to lose a lot of their water. And so a lot of the water is going to leave their cells. And so they actually risk drying out. And so they could dehydrate. And so to compensate for the water loss, a marine fish is actually going to constantly be drinking seawater. And so again, obviously if you drink seawater, this is going to bring in a lot of unneeded salt. And so this is going to be carried to, by the blood to the gills, and it's going to be secreted by special salt secretory cells. Now because we have such an enormous variety of fish, this is going to lend itself to quite a few different types of feeding behaviors. But if you look at this group as a whole, most fish are still considered carnivores. Most of them will feed on zooplankton, insect larvae, and various other aquatic animals. 
but you need to understand most fish are not going to chew their food. And they're not going to do that because that would break up the food into lots and lots of small bits and that could possibly block or interfere with the water flow across the gills and so that would upset their ability to respire. So if you can actually crack prey items open with very specialized molar like teeth and if you look down here towards the bottom this would be a fish that actually has teeth that look somewhat similar to ours but they are specially adapted to cracking open things like maybe hard nuts. So as I had said, most of these animals will simply swallow their food whole. And this is gonna be pretty easy because if you think about it, um, if you look at the water pressure on the inside versus the outside, in order for these animals to respire, they have to bring water in. So every single time that they open up their mouth, they can actually sweep food into that oral cavity. Now, as I had said, there's lots of different um, ways that these animals could feed depending on the environment they live in, the type of fish that you're looking at. So as we had said, most are considered carnivores, but we do have those that are primarily plant eaters. They'd be considered herbivores. Um, some, maybe your smaller fish, might be suspension feeders. Omnivores, which you could eat both plants and animals. Um, a few are scavengers, a few detritivores, kind of feeding on that decomposing material at the bottom or there might even be a few that actually would be considered parasites. So the very last thing we need to do is we need to talk about reproduction and growth. Now as I had said, because there are such a huge variety of fish out there, um, again, the way that these animals actually do reproduce can definitely vary. But most fishes are considered dioecious, which means that they have both male and female representatives. Now, they're going to have external fertilization and most of them will have external development, but again, there are exceptions to the rule. For example, when you look at guppies and mollies, those are types of fish that you might find in the aquarium. These represent examples of those fish that are considered ovoviviparous. And think back to when we talked about sharks. Ovoviviparous is those fish that could actually keep their eggs on the inside, and basically the eggs hatch on the inside, and it appears that they're giving birth to live young. So they do develop in what we consider an ovarian cavity, but remember with this group there is definitely no connection between the mother and the offspring. So the mother doesn't provide any type of nutrients to those developing embryos. Now some sharks, again as we had said, are considered viviparous and they do have some sort of attachment or connection to their young. So they will provide some nourishment through that placenta. Now, as we had said, most fish are going to be considered oviparous, which means they lay eggs. In fact, those fish that are considered pelagic, in other words, those fish that live in the open ocean, can lay huge number of eggs, and they have to, because in that type of environment, most of the time, most of those eggs are going to be consumed as food by other fish. But again, you think about four to six million eggs being released at one time, the hope is you have a small handful that will actually reach adulthood. All right, so that's going to finish up our very last screencast for chapter 24. And again, we're moving pretty quickly during fourth quarter. So as always, please make sure that you have completed your screencast study guide before you come to class.